einen wunderschönen guten Morgen. And um, the talk is in English, so I switch to English. Um, thanks for coming. It seems to be quite early still, though it's 2 p.m. already. People are still a bit sleepy. So thanks for joining the talk on uh, collecting and for young collectors. So with us there is uh, Jacqueline Novikovsky on my right hand side. She's a young collector here from Austria. She's a representative of Bonhams, Sydney. Sydney is a young collector, has been now featured in press about his collection and also a supporter of the fair here. And uh, he collects Austrian art, Austrian young art and also international art. He will get to the details of it. And to my right-hand side, Ivo Wessel. Ivo is from Berlin and uh, is a supporter of the, let's say, difficult art. And um, he's not only a collector, as uh, none of us is, but we're actually also professionals in maybe different fields and not only in the art field. Um, and, I mean, we are now, or I'm doing this talk in the fourth round. Can you, everyone hear me? Okay. I have little problems with my voice. Um, Well, I'm the uh, artistic director of, of the fair here. And four years ago, we started the initiative uh, to talk about um, yeah, why to collect, and f but not only with established collectors that have been collecting for the last 20 years or 15 years or however long, but actually for the young people and to motivate them uh, to get and to come here and uh, to get uh, and, yeah, education about what to buy and how to buy. So I still miss a couple of my people that I was inviting. I hope they're like on the way and not sleeping. So uh, actually I brought them here to be educated, especially by you. So I would like to uh, start with Jacqueline. Jacqueline, um, when and how did you start collecting? So at what age? I don't know whether there's a starting point or whether, I mean, I know of many people who have one moment and all of a sudden they realize that they want to own pieces. With me, it was natural and I was raised in a house where we were surrounded with art and we were dragged to every single museum on this planet in every city where we ever went. And wanting to own these piece, pieces has something is something completely different. Um, I don't see collecting as an activity and I don't see it as a mere purpose in itself. I think if you have an ongoing dialogue with art and especially with artists, which is the most interesting part, you get to know the oeuvre of a specific artist and you get to dig into that oeuvre and into his universe and then you feel uh, a proximity to the, to the thoughts, to the aesthetics, and that's when you actually start wanting to own some of these pieces. And when people talk about education, about collecting, it's not only to have an, an advisor who will tell you to look at this and this and this and that. It will also be your very own approach to getting to know the history of art and the art that interests you, and then finding your way into um, the niches that actually interest you, because there's a huge difference um, between knowing what happens and knowing what you're interested in. So I wanted to start with you because I thought I know you of your family history and I know you've been in that collection, in the history of collecting, your parents have been collecting and you grew up with art. And my question is especially, and I want to give people, I don't know, maybe the three advices, the two um, advices from each of you at the end of, the, of this talk, what to do if you don't come from a family, family of collectors, and actually that you're here maybe for the first time at all at an art fair, and you hear we, yeah, the few people that came late, um, that you actually encounter art, uh, I don't know, from press, yeah, and I want that you give advice um, that people normally and young people who are don't have a family connection to art, they encounter art in press, yeah? So the um, record results of the auctions, one, then, um, I don't know, and the big museum shows, two, and this always comes like with a big price tag, yeah? Several millions, several millions, or several hundred thousands. So I seem and I feel there's a lack of what is the relationship to me, to me as a young person, to me maybe. I'm owning some money or I'm making some money and I actually want, like, I want, yeah, I'm interested, I'm fairly interested, but it seems like so far away. And I recently was invited, um, I don't know, to like a conference for young leaders and I was the only one person representing culture. 
So I stood up and said, um, I just give a little story. And I said, listen, people, listen up. Everyone was like in startups and uh, telecommunication and everyone wanted to change the world. And I'm like, okay, people, but you actually change the world, but you have to do something with values, yeah? So, and values and culture and art, that's very close. And I gave a couple of um, examples. They're like, yeah, you go, you, you have a point. And I'm like, okay, name me one, one artist that you know that is still alive, you know? And I had like a group of 22 people of, uh, I don't know, um, the age 22 till 40 or like 35, and they actually couldn't give me one single name of a living artist. And these are people that are well-educated, that make money, and that want to change the world. You know, and that is very, very sad. So I actually brainwashed them pretty strongly. And I want that you help me with that also today. Yeah? So where do, do you start? How do I get that connection? How do I get my, my personal connection to culture? So Sydney, I mean, I would like to, to pose the next question then to you. You, I don't know whether you grew up with art, but actually you're also a businessman, yeah? You do business. And how did you get to art? And um, how do you, I mean, you also encounter people from the business world. How do you, like, sell them art, as in the approach to art? Um, I started by, I mean, first of all, I have to say, I collect together with my wife, who isn't here, unfortunately. Of course, that's so very it's like good, thank you. a small family collection, and the reason why we started is our... Because child is 10 years old, and when he came, like, we decided, okay, we want to give him one piece of art, and that's how all the madness started. And back then, we went to Galerie Sen, who is also showing here, and bought one small piece by Michael Riedel, and that's how the collection started. And I think the important thing for me, in my point of view, is that you collect people from your own generation. As for me, for example, it wouldn't make sense to buy, I mean, I also don't have the budget for this, I wouldn't buy a 70, 80 year old artist. I think like what I understand most also is people who are at my age and I started collecting 10 years ago and follow mostly artists who live and work in Vienna. And Do you know all of the artists that you're collecting? Yeah. Yeah, and for me, I, have, I, I know there's a lot of collectors who have a very different point of view. For me, it's very essential to know the artist and to know the studio and to know the projects. And I also really like to get involved with, with the artists I collect and make projects. That's a very essential part of how I like to collect. And therefore, there's always, like in our collection, there's pieces that are very unusual. Like, we don't really, like have a lot of paintings, but a lot of objects, sculptures, stuff like this. So for example, right now we're having a project with Albert Meyer and he's doing a sound installation in the public space or in a half public space and that's, that's my approach. And Ivo, so I'm turning to you because I was just referring to these cool kids that are dealing with startups and everyone is, is in trying to, to raise money. So um, you are in this basically startup scene in Berlin. So how do you, I mean, if you talk to them business, when you switch to your, I don't know, private interests, how do you s sell them people that have no clue about art culture? How do you sell them your interest to art? Yeah, uh, I also, uh, like Jacqueline, grew up with art. So I really uh, had the privilege that I grew up with art and literature and, well, computers. This was my uh, third uh, obsession from from pupils' time, time on, but I always would advise that not to exchange um, uh, money with time. So it's always a matter of time to collect. So uh, some people just think, oh, I just have a lot of money, so I, I can collect. No, then you just buy. So collecting does really mean something else. And of course, no one starts as a collector. So you just start with a certain piece. And of course, um, you just need time to build this kind of know-how. So you have to learn to see art. And so this is uh, really not so easy. It's um, similar to all those books, for instance. I really grew up with a lot of literature, and so I always had to decide, uh, do I have to buy a new book, or do I have to buy a piece of art? So it was always a tough question for me. And um, um, sometimes people, especially software developers, just came to me in, in, in my office, and they see this uh, huge uh, library, and they always say, oh, I don't have the time to read. And they always 
mean it in a way, oh, if you have time to read books, then you're kind of loser in your business, because when you're very successful in the business, then they just don't have time. And if they don't say, oh, maybe I just read one book in my summer holiday, then you always answer, no, but that's not reading, because reading one book a year is uh, the same stuff if you just would say, oh, I just buy one piece because it's a successful artist. From my point of view, collecting starts really if there is no reason. If you have any reason, then, well, there are reasons. Maybe you have an empty space in your room, or maybe it's a good opportunity. Of course, it's nice to, to, to do that, but it's not really collecting. So collecting really starts when there are no reasonable reasons. Yeah. That's a, that's a difficult selling point to some of my, my friends, at least. Yeah? So I know the constraint of time. And uh, so how do you deal and what's your next piece of advice if someone tells me, oh, I can't read a book, how can I then go to a museum? Museums close at six. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm not then just not going to buy art and not going to deal with art. What's your next p piece of advice? Yeah, maybe it's also a, a form of respect to have this time, to have at least, let's say, one day a week free for the art. So art is not so easy to achieve, yeah? It's, it's not uh, something that you just, you just have to write some numbers on a check. That's not collecting, that's buying. Yeah? For instance, uh, some friends, especially in the young Berlin startup scene, it's for me so nice whenever I, I'm in a group of soft developers, I'm always the oldest one. But as a collector, I'm a young collector, so that's really uh, very, very nice. But I always say to them, for me, collecting is not an Olympic discipline, so it has nothing to do with competition or something. Yeah? So I really don't like to collect successful art, for instance. I just have some artists, and I really don't know why there are my favorite artists. It's just a kind of very, very personal stuff. And once I came into a collection in Berlin uh, uh, from, from somebody who collects photography. It was so strange because every single piece he had on the wall, he was able to show me a catalog and always says, oh, this photo was the title motif for this or that catalog. And for me it was so absurd because, of course, artists will choose a good photo, a good art, a good piece for a catalog, but from a collector's perspective, it's so absurd not to have a very personal addiction to a piece. So I really would have preferred if this guy would told me, oh, this is the photo where I met my girlfriend first, or something like this. So this would really be a value. Yeah? But there is this one very nice sentence from Oscar Wilde, people know the price from everything and the value of nothing. So I'm really interested in the value of things but they cannot just achieve by giving money. And, I mean, you're quoted always, and you're here at the Young Collector's Talk. How old, no, how old were you when you bought your first piece? <laughs> yeah, I was a young people, and uh, I have uh, brought some, some, some images here, and I brought the image of my first computer, which I bought in uh, 79. Most of the people were not born then, I think, so, yeah, I'm an old collector. And I uh, also had my first piece, I bought um, 80 two on the documenta, uh, where my mother is, she's also in the audience, uh, put uh, the, the, the children to, and um, the Joseph Beuys uh, edition on the documenta 82. So how old were you? It was, I was uh, 15, 15, 16 then, and um, it was not my, my very first piece, so I, I bought many editions and, and, and little stuff, and, um, but this Beuys edition was the first one where I really had the impression, oh, I had to frame it in a professional way, because I just have to preserve it. And I think this is also a, a task a collector has to, has to fulfill, yeah? to just keep things, keep things alive. Yeah? And going back, sorry, because I, I see some people that I also invited from the business world who always tell me they have time constraints and they're so busy and they have other choices to make. So in your uh, startup community, or in your people that surrounding you. So when they come to your office, how do you, like, are you regarded then a, a loser, as you said, <laughs> in business because you have so much time in your hand to actually, I don't know, read a book, buy some art? How do you explain it to them? Yeah, it's just nice to, to be on this um, parallel universe, to just say, oh, my last time, I, I, maybe I spent weeks or months on, on bed reading books, 
yeah? And then um, I don't do my professional work, so I, I don't earn any money, so I can't buy any other art pieces. But in this time, maybe I'm very happy because I just can go to exhibitions. I can ju just can read books and do this stuff to just get know-how. And I think mm -hmm. getting know-how is really a kind of privilege because um, this can achieve by all the people. All the people have money, and of course, all the people have more money than myself, but maybe I have more time. The time, good, I want to keep this time constraint issue. And so, also, maybe, um, Jacqueline, so when you deal with an art piece, how long does it take you to decide to buy a work of art? It generally depends whether you're already acquainted with the artist or not, whether you know from what universe that piece comes from, and then there's two different approaches. There's um, the approach that you actually want to own a piece by this artist because it's like a brand and you identify with it, and you will hope for all these, um, all these characteristics to then chill their light on you. But then there's a different approach which is much more intimate and much more personal. This is when you find a piece and a part of yourself in an art piece. And this is the part where I think it's incredibly brave of every collector to open his house for random strangers to just walk into it and have this very voyeuristic look onto a part of his soul that is displayed on the walls or on the floors or wherever because it reveals a great deal of yourself and that very personal approach can hit you instantly you see the piece and you just know that it can also disappear over times and many collectors such as myself I like to put pieces away after a certain time and then not have them around me it's very soothing to know I have them but I don't need to see them every day and then other pieces take ages you need you like pieces that you've seen of a certain artist, but you just have not found your piece yet. Like, I'm chasing a piece by one artist I have in my head. It's an obsession, and I haven't found it yet. No, but my question is also to the audience. I mean, I want to come up then that people actually get advice, you know? I want to give people advice that they go out to the fair and can apply these rules. I mean, there are some people in the audience that don't buy you know, that come, and they come here to be educated and then eventually go and buy at the fair. So please think of rules, how we can help the audience to go out. And so how but do you do your homework yeah, before that's buying? That's the very important that's my point. Question. The homework is the key thing. The fair is beautiful, but it's a tip of the iceberg. The fair is, everything is being served on a silver platter to you guys. There is so much preparation. The gallerists have chosen the pieces of the artists that they decide to show on in, in some circumstances, it will be because there is a museum show opening simultaneously in other instances because the artist is just um, important for another reason at, the, at this moment. But the homework is the key element where you should spend your time all the time, or not should, but would want to in an ideal case. Go out to the openings, go out to the studios, look for the dialogue with the artists, if, especially if they're young and if they live in the same city or as uh, Ivo is spoiled with everybody living in Berlin. But um, that's the interesting part, where you actually get to see what there is behind the shiny little facade. And there is a beautiful shiny facade, but there's much more behind it. So talk to the gallerists and talk to the artists. And what we do at the, at the secession, as you know, there's the young secession. Um, every museum has a board of supporters, and they will do so much for you. If you support a museum, and it can be a minimal, minimal way of supporting the, this house, if you like the program of the house. They will take you through openings, they will take you to artist studios, they will do so much to educate you. You just have to go out and look for the right place where you want to That's a time constraint that kicks in. So, Sydney, thank you. Sydney, so your first piece, how did you buy, I mean, you described the story of it, but how much time did you actually invest before you made that decision and how much time do you leave to make a decision or do you buy instantly? I buy instant, I would say. I love that, yeah. It's good. Yeah, totally. Like, well, I wish to buy instant, but I think like always when I see a piece, I know instantly whether it hits me or not. And there's very few pieces that take a long time for myself to really get into my head. And but what, is, what are the rules? What 
Okay, so I mean, you, if you say I buy local artists, I, I buy, we, I say just I buy local artists and I buy my like, generation artists that were your. Like Michael rules. Riedl, for example, is a German artist that uh, doesn't really like fit, if you can say that, to the collection. And in the beginning, I had no idea. I just wanted to have things and art pieces. And then I think, like with most of the collectors, once you start collecting, you also develop yourself yeah? and you get to know yourself way better. And I think that's when the collection really starts to get a frame and a direction. And I think this is something that needs time always. Yeah? Because I think a collection in the first year will be a different collection than after 10 years. And I think a very important part of collecting is, of course, money. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't have this issue, but most people do. And I think that's one point why ordinary people don't collect because they think it's always super expensive but I think most of the living artists you always are able to get very good works that are not expensive and therefore I should really I would advise people to try it out eh? and like get to meet artists get to meet galleries and don't be shy to tell them hey I have 1500 euro and with this 1500 euro I'm interested to buy a piece, I buy an edition or something like this. And I think it's very possible. And one of the most interesting collections is uh, Herb and Dorothy Vogel, American collectors. I mean, he was working at the post office, she was a librarian, and they collected the biggest minimal art collection in America uh, with average incomes just by being at every exhibition in every studio. And I think for me, that's an interesting point. Huh? And yeah. Just um, for so the audience, the Vogels are always cited as one of the like the the, um, the prime collectors. They've been working at the post office and they always spend half of their income on art. And uh, by doing that, consequently, they got together in a, an amazing, incredible collection. And uh, so it's always the story also to say, well, it actually does relate to you and that you can buy art. You don't have to, to buy at auction or you have to buy incredibly expensive pieces, but you absolutely have, have the approach to it and all doors open. Just Sydney, just another question that I always hear back. So when I buy, can I resell it and how much money does it bring to me? Will it like raise in money? Will I make profit on it? This is like from someone uh, who is not really educated and not at all, but someone like, I hear people need reasons to buy. So what is your answer to someone who says, will I make profit on that? Will it go into auction? I think everybody's charmed if you buy work for a thousand euro and then it's worth a hundred thousand. I think like everybody's ego is a little happy with this one, but I think that's not the main, main reason to collect art. Eh? I think everybody should really like fit it in the pocket that's possible and yeah I think you just have to go for it yeah? I mean you can buy editions you can buy books yeah? I mean you don't have to like start with paintings yeah? start little I think that would be my advice yeah? but if someone comes to you okay Sydney <clears throat> I have this amount of money and I want to make like a smart choice yeah. because I don't know, I'm in banking, I'm an investment banker, and I want just to make smart choices. I have a time constraint. I mean, I'm better with money, but still, I'm not really into it. How do I make a choice? Um, I think, first of all, you have to decide you want to keep it forever or you want to sell it. I think that's a main... For, forever is a difficult... I think that's as very long, long as you live, yeah? Or, like, I think that's a very important issue. Yeah? If you're aiming to buy works that you are going to sell in five years, I would advise you probably to buy something very, very different than if you say, I want to start a collection for the next 20 years. Yeah, then I would go for very different pieces if money is the issue. Yeah. Um, and if you're an investment banker buying, I would probably say, go to the artist and ask him what he would, or her, what he would advise to you. Yeah. Ivo, so what would be your piece of advice to someone who says, well, I actually, like, I consider myself cultural. I have, I don't know, a budget of 10,000 maybe a year, maybe more. I have actually more money, I could more, but I'm just a bit scared. How do I start? Just, just start with the first piece. But how do I so get to that first piece? Because I see it in the museums. I don't know any galleries. All people want to sell me. I'm scared to go into a gallery. What do I do? 
Yeah, maybe it's um, the same stuff with uh, partners. So um, I always choose my partners by myself. Yeah? So same with art. Maybe there are some professionals who can do that better. But for, for my girlfriends, I always choose them by myself. That, that's and, a nice answer. Uh, many, many years I was asked, um, or, or, or 10 or 12 collectors were asked, what uh, would, would, would you advise if, if somebody, uh, as a new collector, just want to give 5,000 euros, what will be advised? And I really was the only one, beside Falkenberg, Ingrid Goetz, and, and uh, all the collectors of the world. And I was really the only one who just said, well, 5,000 euros is quite a lot of money. So I didn't start with 5,000 euros. Yeah? I would just advise to cut it by 10 and say, okay, 500 euros, for instance, for a little edition, 500 euros for a trip to, Ve to Venice, to Biennale, or 500 euros to, to uh, Kassel, to the Documenta, five, 500 euros to go to Vienna, to the art fair, 500 euros to, to buy some catalogs, and maybe another 500 euros to buy some coffee and cake to, to, to go to, the art, to, to a studio of an artist. Yeah? But to just go to a gallery and ask the gallerist, what can I, do, what can I have for 5,000 euros? It's so stupid. Yeah? It's so stupid because then if, if your friends uh, will visit you and they just ask, oh, what's that piece on the wall? You have to say, oh, I don't know, but it must be a good piece because the galleries have said so. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. So just start with the with the first piece and don't care about uh, yeah losing money because the profit is always there. It's not the profit for selling, but for living with a piece. So I live with a piece for for 40 or 35 years and. Uh, for instance, I had a little photo uh, once I, I, I wasn't able to go to, a, to, a, to an ex exposition, to, a, to an opening, and the artist was so friendly to send me the drill dust of all the holes he had drilled for the exhibition in a simple envelope, just with a stamp, with, with a, a, a sign of the gallerist and a little signature. It even was given for free, so it, so it even doesn't cost any money. But for me, it's one of my most valuable pieces I had in my collection because it's just a kind of friendship you need to get those pieces. So just try to, to, to get in this area because then the profit is not only by selling a piece or getting profit by money. Yes, I wanted like pin down more, more concrete. <coughs> Sorry. I want to make it more concrete. So if you came here, um, by each of you, if, if I'm, I'm new to, the, to this world, I like 10 pieces in the fair or in the gallery. How would you recommend to make a choice for one piece? Maybe throwing the dice. <laughs> so um, I really found my, all my artists accidentally. So this is something they really have to accept. All my artists are not the best artists of the world. That's totally stupid. For me, they are the most important artists, for my person. But I just know maybe my girlfriend is not the best girlfriend ever. Yeah? But for me, well, one day I just have to take this decision. Yeah? and go through all the up and downs with it. And it's the same with art. So I really don't like to collect successful artists because then all the people will say, oh yeah, you have to collect this or that because he's so successful. Yeah? Especially if you're living in Berlin, then all the people collect to name uh, uh, an artist, uh, uh, Alicia Quade, for instance. But she's so successful, but then I don't read all the best-selling books. Yeah? It's the same stuff. Because I just want to go into, into other ranges where there are really kind of, of making decisions and making the decision to buy a Gerhard Richter for instance is absolutely stupid because it's not a decision it's just oh well he has the money but you stand in front of a Gerhard Richter and who will really say oh that's a bad piece yeah so I really love to to answer question if people visit my collection yeah they do say oh what the hell is this or that piece and this is for instance one reason why I love to collect video art, because so, for, for so many people it seems to be stupid because video art, oh, you can just copy the DVD, which is not true because you just get the certificate. And if you buy the number one of an edition of five, you also get the kind of street credibility you maybe get if you buy Gerhard Richter. But I really love this kind of um, posing question, asking questions. So just meet collectors. I think it's also as important as to meet the artists or to meet the galleries or maybe also to meet the curators. 
Ja. But um, how do you relate to art? I mean, how um, you said it's not a Gerhard Richter, but for your collection, how did you choose your path for video and for complicated uh, artworks? How? What is the reasoning behind it? Yeah, it's really a little bit like uh, falling in love. So sometimes it's it's a second. Yeah, sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's really more. So sometimes pieces have really to convince me. And sometimes that's really a, a tough job because um, I never stand in a queue for a piece. Yeah, so then you have to be in a hurry or you have to be quick or something. So I always love to, to oversleep decisions. Yeah? And with video art, it's so nice because um, I really love this kind of option, like books on a shelf. Yeah? So uh, video art is not re representative at all. So you just can can take it out, you can put it in, but it's, it's always a kind of, um, well, thinking or a kind of how to live with stuff. Do you live with video art or do yeah, you... Of course. And do you have screens installed at yeah. home? Different screens, different um, stuff. So, for instance, I can solder stuff because I'm a kind of technical nerd. So I always use the equipment I have in that times. I always use them to show my... <laughs> to show uh, video pieces. For instance, nowadays I, I will do it on an iPad, for instance, yeah, wireless uh, 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 to, 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 to a screen. But uh, 20 years ago, well, it was a, a kind of, of a media player. Or 15 years ago, it was just a kind of tablet PC. And of course, I have the privilege to program my technical equipment to just um, get around of all of these problems you have with VR. But on the other hand, um, it's part of the game. So it's really nice to just uh, come across all these problems you have. For instance, I bought a piece of Christian Markley in the middle of the 90s with an edition of 250, which was great because it was the only reason why, I, why it was affordable for me because uh, nowadays it, it would cost a, a fortune. But in the 90s, 250 copies of a video piece was nearly unlimited. And nowadays, so many people from America or from, from all over the world visit my collection. And if they are interested in video art, they all have this piece by Christian Markley. And that's terrific. And I really don't understand galleries who say, oh, uh, we, we have to limit the number of copies to, let's say, five copies, because otherwise the collectors won't buy. But it's so stupid. It's so nice to share things. So I understand you come from this nerd technology side, OK? I just have, I'm trying to put it a little bit in boxes to make it more understandable. Jacqueline, can you explain with what sort of art do you live? Um, to be very honest with very little of it. Um, it's just a personal decision. Um, but I think it's also related to what I do. If you work with art every day and if art in, in my um, life has two um, dimensions. It's a professional daily life and then it's a personal passion. And um, when you deal with it on a daily basis and as a commodity, you have to be very careful that you don't lose the passion for it because it can very quickly become just an, a good a t-shirt or a jeans and just as well, it could have been an artwork. Um, and to make it stay special, to make it stay a story rather than just a, an item is a bit of an exercise. Um, someone who is much smarter than me once said that generally you have three sorts of collections if you are a collector. You have the pieces you own, you have the pieces you've sold, and you have the pieces that unfortunately you could not have, but you really, really, really wanted them. So that's also a sort of story. Which pieces do you live with? And the interesting piece is always the next one, or the one you missed, or the one you feel sorry to not have um, seen properly at a time. Um, and what I see with myself is that at the moment I've lost interest in some of the pieces that I have. I just think they're, they, they stop talking to me. And so it tells you a lot, as Sydney said, it tells you a lot about who you were at that time and how you've developed since. And, um, and it's an ongoing love story. You will eventually fall back in love with the pieces. Um, but it's a very, um, very individual thing. What do you live with and what not? So we started from Evo to give advice. So if I like 10 pieces here, how do I narrow down my choices? What would you advise? 
I'm a girl, so um, it's really difficult to make the one decision on only the 10. <laughs> but um, other than that, I think um, the question is always, if you take your time, and I'm not as instant as you are, I'm, I, I need more time to think about it, I need to sleep about it, and I need to know um, more about the artist to then make an educated decision. Um, so I really think that narrowing it down is, um, is a result of your homework. It's a very um, sincere question. Would you miss not having the piece? It's very simple. Would you regret not having it? Or would you regret having it? <laughs> okay, let, got that. We'll go, come back to it. Sydney, how would you, if you like 10 pieces, and they, I don't know, vary in price or about the same, how would you decide for one or two? So what is your, the questions that you ask in order to narrow it down? I mean, thinking about it, a lot of pieces that I bought, I bought directly in the studio. And I think, like, if somebody is able to visit the artist's studio, that's where you get the best pieces. And the best pieces, I think, are mostly on the desk of the artist or with some dust on it that stand around for a long time that maybe influence the artist themselves or help them working or have been part of a process. And like coming back to a small budget, if I would recommend anybody to buy a starting piece, probably I would say a drawing. Because in a drawing, I think, if the artist is drawing, um, you can see a lot. And it's still an original, what I like a lot. And yeah, therefore, and I think drawings are totally on the art market, totally underrated. So I think if you are really going to find a strong piece by an artist you like and probably can't afford, I would always go for a drawing. How much time do you actually spend on art or on culture in your daily routine? All, all my time. <laughs> I mean, I have two kids, but like, they are also like part of it, and they love it already. And like, it's uh, it's part of my my daily life. Yeah? And I, lot, lots of my friends are artists or became friends. Um, and there's also like, there's always an interesting part, like whether are you able to collect an artist that you personally don't like. But the works are amazing, and I think that's a very important part there to separate the work from the person. I have a hard time doing that, but I think that's an important one. And yeah. And but I spent, since I'm also doing a lot of art projects, that's what, what I spend all my time with. I encounter a lot of people that um, when they stand in front of a piece, they like it, young people. They like it and they think about it very hard. They sleep over it or, but they, they seem not to make, to be able to make the decision. Though the money is there, the space is there. There's an empty wall over the sofa, so all is there. But they seem not to be able, they're afraid to make mistakes. And I wonder whether, oh no, it's back. Um, I wonder um, whether you can help me um, to, to I don't know, to ease them, to get, like, to, to help them, to ease them, that they're not afraid of making mistakes. And how do you deal with, oh, yeah, it's nice. Um, and how do you deal with making mistakes by choosing things? Yeah, but making your own decision is never making a mistake. So it's absolutely impossible to make a mistake if you just like the piece. And this is, for instance, one reason I, 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 I never sell a piece. And uh, the same, I never sell a book. Maybe there are a lot of, there are thousands of books I read when I was a, was a child. And, uh, well, they are maybe not uh, so important any longer for me. But I, they are still part of my, my history and part of my, my personality, if, if you like. So, so uh, the same with decisions. So just be tough enough. Just make a decision. And it's a long-life relationship. And it's nice. So there are no mistakes. Yeah? Jacqueline, how do you, how can we help people to loosen up and not to be afraid to make mistakes in terms of choosing art? Um, well, first of all, being brave is something that everybody decides on his own by his own benchmarks. And if, if you're, the question is, are you so afraid of actually making a mistake that it inhibits you of doing it? If that's 
the, the fear, then I would depict the person you're describing as a, a, an incredibly fearful person who's afraid of just doing something um, doing something wrong. There is no wrong, but the, 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 the I'm really fascinating... I'm money, yeah. probably. The, the even fear of losing the value of what you've invested is something that when people come to me um, as an auctioneer and they ask me, what is it worth? Now we do valuations constantly and they reflect, either, either they reflect the, the valuations reflect the mood of a market or the rise and, and, and uh, decline of uh, the common taste or how the importance of an artist, but it will never reflect on your relationship to the piece. Now, if you are afraid of losing what you've invested in the piece, nobody has a glass bowl and nobody will ever tell you whether there's a return to be made on the piece or not. It is just simply not possible. And if a gallerist tells you, oh, you will be able to sell that for the double, run away because he's lying to you. Nobody has the ability of predicting the future. But that's risk and it's a funny risk because as you said, there's an ego thing that the other, other people will then discover what you've discovered first. And the secondary market is nothing else but the punishment for the people who came too late. Being first and buying on the first, um, the, the primary market is nothing else but the first choice. So here what you have in galleries is the first choice. If you come too late and the pieces are not available anymore, you'll have to go to auction or um, secondary market galleries. Um, so that's the reward of being brave. And then what you also have to factor in is that there's this um, incommensurable aspect, the joy it gives you. And that can't be valued in any sort of currency. So you live with the piece and it gives you the greatest of pleasure or the greatest of intellectual challenges for the time that it has this validity. And then when it loses it, well then, then a pair of sneakers, you, can't, you will wear them and they'll be very useful as long as they're good, but then you'll just throw them away. So why does everybody expect art to be forever valuable and then raising in value? It, maybe it's just something that's momentary and that will then have just evaporate after a certain time. Sydney. And I just sorry, I just want to say one more thing because the, the aspect of drawings is brilliant. I've had the conversation with many of my friends who say, but drawings are too ephemeral and they're not strong enough. One of our most brilliant curators here in Vienna who works in one of the biggest museums um, collects himself something completely different from what the museum does. And he collects contemporary artists, whereas he works in uh, at the Kunsthistorisches Museum, and he said that most of the drawings that he bought cost him more to frame than actually to buy the art piece. So you should just keep, put things into perspective. It's not that much the affordability, it's really finding the treasure for yourself. Sydney, so how can we help, from your perspective, people to loosen up making the decision? I think um, if you don't take yourself too serious and look at your hairstyle that you were wearing with 14 years, then you realize immediately you always made mistakes. Yeah? And I think it's the same with an art collection. Like now in 2015, you have a complete different perspective of the world that you will probably have in 10 years. So I think there is no... Maybe the biggest mistake now is the biggest success in 20 years. I think that it's hard to tell or the other way around. Maybe you think, okay, now I bought this amazing piece, but in 10 years it bores you totally and it like lands somewhere. So I think like not buying a piece probably is the biggest mistake you can do. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe, I mean, you have, I've seen all of you several times around here at the fair. Um, maybe you can give just a piece of advice navigating this particular fair. What is that? What do you look in this fair and where would you go to this time or at generally? Yeah, I would just recommend just use um, all possibilities. So just uh, go to the galleries, go to the studios, go, go wherever you like. And um, yeah, there is this uh, one uh, very nice uh, work of uh, Lawrence Wiener and it's just called Learn to Read Art. And so, yeah, this is maybe my advice to all the art lovers around there. So just, uh, you cannot go wrong. Just start with your first piece. Jacqueline, how to educate myself and um, yeah, how to learn about art? What would be your advice? I feel like I, I wouldn't know what to tell people because I am constantly learning. I go to people that I respect and ask them how to look at artists' works that I don't understand and just 
be curious and ask and don't be shy to say, I don't understand that. I don't understand most of the stuff that I see all day long. But can you speak about the secession as one example? For example, the secession has um, yeah, a group of young people that love art. They have a group of people that is older, the older generation of art lovers. What do they do? Can you just explain a little bit more? and how it works and how do you actually support the museum and what it does for you because actually all museums in the world lo like work in the same sort of principle. The secession in Austria is an artist association so um, as opposed to a museum that is a, a house that has its own collection an artist association is run by artists and does not have its own collection so the secession in Vienna was founded um, in the late 19th century and Turn, turn of the century, and um, people who at the time were terribly revolutionary, like Klimt, were founding members. So um, what we do today is actually nothing, not so different from what they did at the time. Um, artists choose artists that they deem worthy of being exhibited, can be elder artists, like now in November, Via Selmans is going to open the very first show in ages, and she hardly ever does new show, so that's spectacular for such an important woman artist to be shown for the first time in Austria. Um, and at the moment, Mark Lecky, who is a video artist, is um, on show. Basically, what this house does is that they show artists that have been selected about um, amongst from the most se severe critics that they are their peers. The, the artists are so strict in their judgment, and if whom they select is just really interesting to see. And what the um, friends of the secession do is that they support this house because being an artist association, they do not benefit from the same public funding system as museums do. Now, these members of uh, the friends have been around forever and have been doing incredibly supportive work. And they just um, realize that they are getting older and that they need new people to support the house. And as Sydney also said, it's the artists of our generation that are now being exhibited. And um, so what we did is we sat down and we thought of a program that would be interesting enough for people to um, attract them into the house. And as um, this is a very avant-gardist house, the art is not always intellig intelligible to anybody um, at first sight. So you need to have a bit of an understanding so what we do is we have curators explain um, exhibitions. We go to mountings before the um, exhibition is opened. So the artist will actually be there and will tell us a bit about the, what he's doing. What we also do, because I think it is important to just um, be a bit more um, open-minded, is that we also go to all the other exhibitions in Vienna that have either a sort of connection to what the secession does or that have a historical link. For instance, um, uh, Klimt's drawings at the Albertina, some stuff that is very old and then also very new um, things that but are being... But do you have to attend? I mean, just, is it, how often is it? Is it once a month, once a week? I just want to It give depends on the example. month. We have okay. months where we do four things a month, where we do three things a week and then uh, over the summer it's a bit more quiet and you do not have to be a paying member just to come. We let, we, that's the point. We want it to be a platform where people who are interested come and look, and if they want to join, which is of course the ultimate goal, we would love them to become a member to support the house, but it's not a must. It, it's more of an encounter. I want to see my friends, and I work too much to see them on a daily basis and sit out and hang out at cafes, so we meet up at exhibitions. That's nice. That's, that's a good way to see friends, I think. Sydney, what would be another like piece of advice we're gathering just advice here in the session um, how to go around and how to educate yourself about art I think people shouldn't like it wouldn't make sense to look at another collection I think you really should like know who you are and what you're interested in and I think that's the starting point uh, it wouldn't make sense for like I, I think that's the essential thing you really should like think about yourself, think about your values, your goals in life, and I think around that you start an interesting collection. And the, as you said before, the worst thing you can do is start buying blue chip artists, because like, first of all, you will never probably get a very good piece, because I mean, as we all know, there's good and bad pieces by every artist. So I should, 
I think really you should think about what do I want with this collection? Where do I want to bring it to? And then you have a starting point very easily. And then you have the first piece and then you live with it. And then you probably want to have a second one or a third one and then you become hooked. Very good. I want to <coughs> finish the session on the statement you become hooked. Yeah, and just as a summary, I think um, Ivo described it very nicely that you enter a relationship with art and with culture and uh, there are lows and there are highs and uh, you will want to have more of it and you shouldn't be afraid yeah i think um, just to take your own decision and uh, know who you are and buy accordingly buy from your own generation um, get knowledge and just don't be scared and ask questions i think that's pretty much the summary of uh, the session now thank you very much thank you